three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk. Brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, we are Grok Talk. Welcome to the program. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers. Thanks again to Susan Olson for spending a half hour with us to talk about gun rights and constitutional carry and all that fun stuff. Uh, thanks again to Rad Moderate. Radical Moderate gave us a call. And, uh, you know, in the opening segment, you folks are welcome to call us, 603-715-9689. That's 603-715-9689. Please check out Granite Grok at on Facebook and Twitter. And, of course, you can listen to this and past programs on Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Ustream, and always at GraniteGrok.com. Our next guest is Steve Lonigan. He's the head of Fix a Dollar Project. You can uh, check them out at FixTheDollar.com. He's the director of monetary policy for the American Principles in Action, former state director for Americans for Prosperity in New Jersey, and he was also the mayor of Bogota, New Jersey. Please welcome to the program Steve Lonigan. Good morning. Did we lose him? We... I guess we lost him. Oh, we lost him. Oh, no. All right. Well, don't welcome to the program, Steve. Oh, there he is. Maybe he's calling us. He got the number. Okay. I, it's just pick it up. No, just hit play. Hello. Hey, yeah. I got cut off. Oh, you did? So our system yeah. hung up on you. Good morning. <laughs> no problem. I'm just sitting here. Sorry. That's okay. Great. Great to have you there. Um, you, uh, let me turn that down so you can put that back on. Okay, great. All right, well, I gave you a great introduction um, <laughs> Sorry about that. that you missed <laughs> because you were you got hung up. Uh, everything I don't know about myself. Everything you don't know, right, yeah. yes. Weren't you, one of the, weren't you one of the guys that ran for governor as well a couple of cycles I ago? ran uh, in a special election against Cory Booker when Frank Lautenberg died in New Jersey in 2013 in what was a very high-profile race. Uh, I had the honor of having Mark Levin and Sarah Palin come in for me for, together for the first time ever. Those two had actually never been together before, and we had probably the largest political event New Jersey's seen in, in 40 years. Uh, Fabulous. But it was, it, it, that election day was October 16, 2013, and it was the, at the end of the 16-day shutdown of the U.S. government. Uh, and that really, uh, it, it killed us in the home stretch. It was very unfortunate timing, but it was, it was a great race. Well, you know, it's uh, it's all about having fun, right? <laughs> Winning and preserving our liberty ultimately is the day. I mean, that, that, yeah. and, and having fun while doing it. True, true, um, true. But, you know, in, in New Jersey, which is really a very blue state, uh, it can get kind of brutal. Oh, so, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, you know, anytime a Republican gets elected in New Jersey, we wonder what kind of Republican they are or if they're fiscally well, conscious. As you've, you learned, know, as you've learned with my, my friend Chris Christie, which is another topic that you may want to discuss, but I want to thank you guys for allowing me to be with you because I'll be spending quite a bit of time in New Hampshire uh, the next several months. As you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but New Hampshire is a critical early primary state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just a bit. Media. We've heard that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should have you in the studio if you're going to be up here. We'll have to get together and, and uh, have you come in, and I we will, can. I will be up there, yeah, Je- guys. My background is I had my own business for 25 years. I was the mayor of a town in New Jersey for 12 years. I was the state director of an organization called Americans for Prosperity here in New Jersey, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. My old friend Corey Lewandowski ran the chapter in New Hampshire while I was in New Jersey. I left that project to run in the U.S. Senate race against Cory Booker. Um, so I've been engaged in politics and economic policy issues for 30 years, going back to when I was a young America for freedom guy for Ronald Reagan when I was in college. And, and, and I have learned over the last decade, working in economic policy issues in New Jersey and nationally, that the biggest issue that I think is that I know threatens the American economy and our own individual prosperity today is the Federal Reserve System. And over the last week, you've seen lots of news stories about how the Federal Reserve held their big meeting on Wednesday, mm-hmm. uh, how they've, not, they've kept interest rates now at zero for near seven years. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a remarkable situation because this is all about our money. Mm-hmm. And you would think 
that the American people would be totally up in arms. This should be, you know, torch and pitchfork time because what they're doing to the American dollar is, is disturbing and, and very concerning. It's actually, it's frightening because what they're doing is they're undermining the value of people's savings, uh, their, their life's work, and their wages. You know, that little piece of paper, the American dollar bill that we to- so take for granted, is the means by which we measure the value of our savings, our wages, the way we trade with one another, the way two people can do business, you know, face-to-face or across the country. They don't even have to like each other and yet rely on this little piece of paper as the way to trade and and to store value. You know, the American dream is to work hard and to save and to achieve a better future through your effort. And savings is the deferring of future happiness, uh, today's happiness for future security. So when you make the choice to save, you say, okay, I'm not going to buy that car today that I'd like to buy or that new couch. Instead, I'm going to put the money away so that 20 years from now I can benefit from that savings so I can save money to invest in the means of production. Maybe I'm going to own a business or build a house or whatever. Today, that savings is being undermined by the Federal Reserve System. Your money is your property. It is the ultimate measure of private property. And private property is the cornerstone of liberty and economic freedom. Without private property, you really have no ability to grow your assets. And I mean, the Magna Carta was all about private property. Um, the dollar is your ultimate measure of private property. But it's not your property when a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in their ivory towers in Washington, D.C., who are unaccountable to Congress and unaccountable to the American people, can manipulate the value of that money right under our very noses, undermine its value, destroy its ability to preserve your savings, destroy savers. That's not your property any longer. You know, Comrade Lenin, coming right off of the Russian Revolution, is infamous for stating that you can undermine the value of currency and not one man in a million will know it. And he took down the upper classes of Russia by destroying the value of their money by just printing rubles ad nauseum. Um, now, I'm not taking this discussion to that level. I'm not saying the Fed is like Lenin. But what I am saying is that our money is something that we should never be taking for granted. And the founding fathers of this country understood this extremely well. During the revolution, back pre-Constitution, uh, the early days of the revolution, the founders had a disconnect from the, the British pound sterling, which was the world's most stable currency. It was based on gold. Even though it's called the pound sterling, it was based on gold. And they began printing paper money called con- called um, uh, continentals. And this printed paper money became the currency of, of the new government of the United States. George Washington was famous for saying, you know, I needed a carload of continentals for a carload of supplies. The founding fathers who converted their British pound sterling, many of them, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, virtually every one of them, lost sheer fortune, lost fortune because their continental paper money, which was once British pound sterling, was just destroyed in value. It just just, just disintegrated in value. And and the old statement, it's not worth a continental, is something was used up to pretty recently in American jargon, meant it was a meaningless piece of paper. So the founders understood the dangers of printed paper money. And the Constitutional Convention, they established Article One, Section 8, which clearly states that only Congress has the right to coin our money and determine its value. Congress must have the sole authority in preserving the value of the American dollar. This was something extremely critical to everybody from Washington to Jefferson and everyone in between. They didn't want government bureaucrats to have the ability to print paper money and destroy its value. They knew what it would do to the country. Uh, Charles Charles Cokesworth, who was one of the delegates from South Carolina, it was interesting, the South Carolina delegation led the battle to preserve, you know, sound gold-based money for the United States, is, is, is noted for stating, if you turn over the ability to create money to bankers, you give control of your money to speculators and schemers. So they didn't have a good view of big banks back then. And in 1792, in the wake of the passage of the Constitutional and Article One, Section 8, establishing that only Congress has the right to corner money to determine its value, Alexander Hamilton wrote the Coinage Act. And the Coinage Act was signed into law by George Washington after being passed overwhelmingly in Congress. 
So we got some pretty good people behind this, con- this, this concept, right? If you think George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and the people who were in Congress at the time would have been James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Monroe. Um, and that established, you know, the, the gold dollar, the gold, $20 gold piece is the sort of preeminent coin, and the $1 silver dollar coin as, as the most popularly used currency. That would be our money for almost the next 200 years. Gold backs money. American money backed by real value, backed by gold. Okay, I got, um, got, got a couple of quick points there uh, on this. One of them is, is is Hamilton, who was also in favor of a central bank, so he, he could kind of split personality on this stuff. But the other yeah. is, could you could you in fact say that the, the Federal Reserve Act and the other things that happened in that period were the beginning of the end of the authority of Congress? In other words, they oh, ra- well, ra- rather, rather than making decisions themselves, they, they elected to pass their power to unelected bureaucrats. Well, that was exactly my next phase. After, after establishing American money, backed by Congress in 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, which was the beginning of abdicating their power to this unelected bunch of bureaucrats. Now, the, the idea behind the Federal Reserve originally was a good one. It was a backstop for the, big, for the banks. You know, J.P. Morgan had basically you know, bailed out Wall Street a couple of times in the earlier part of that century, and he said, look, I can't keep doing this. We have to have a better system. The original Federal Reserve system as set up in 1913 actually was running the gold standard and using gold-backed currency up until, well, really, uh, phases, first Franklin Roosevelt and then uh, Richard Nixon in 1971, who officially killed the gold standard. So the Federal Reserve system, it's remarkable. Charles Hamlin, who was the first Federal Reserve chairman when it was first established, had an event in which he said, with the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there will be no more financial panics. Of course, that would be followed by the depression <laughs> uh, and everything else. So, <laughs> so, so, but, but so there was the no effort, panic. No panic. <laughs> the, the effort that I'm involved in, because I could, with, there's so many aspects of monetary policy and, and the effect on our country we could talk about. What I am engaged in in New Hampshire in the next six months and have been uh, in Iowa and other states is to drive this monetary policy issue that what used to be called the currency debate into the presidential primary and the presidential campaign. We believe it's essential. Many Americans are waking up to this fact that we believe that it's essential that Congress take back its authority over the Federal Reserve System and that we have a president who understands the importance of the Federal Reserve System uh, and makes it an issue in the upcoming campaign. I was very disappointed that CNN did not have a single question, any really good sound economic policy questions, but particularly on the Federal Reserve System in the debate last Wednesday night. Steve, we're going to take a really short break. When we come back, we can maybe come up with a list of questions you would have asked. <laughs> so yeah. uh, stay tuned. Hang on. We'll be right back. I'm Steve McDonald, Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers. We're talking to Steve Lonigan. This is Grok Talk. 